3DO. They came from the depths of the void, an ancient enemy of an ancient people. No one knows why they hate us so, or why they have made war upon us. Some say the struggle against their evil is the mandate of heaven. Though their origins and purpose are shrouded in mystery, their plan is simple. They travel, they land, and then they conquer. Now, they are here on our world to do to us what they have done to so many others. And they will do it, unless someone stops them. Much to learn before you can deal with the likes of those monsters. Since the arrival of the devils, foul creatures and evil spirits have appeared throughout the land. These signs and omens can have but one meaning. That your destiny is part of the Mandate of Heaven. Hello and welcome to Might and Magic 6, the Mandate of Heaven. This game is the first game in the third generation of Might and Magic games. And by most people who have played the entire series, it's considered to be the best game in the entire series. That said, I'm not among those people. I don't think this is the best entry in the series, however it is a big jump forward from the previous entries. So I'm still very excited about the game. And, as you've seen in the intro cutscene, the story is taking place in the continent of Enroth, which is where Heroes of Mind Magic 2 took place. So, it is the first game in the series that actually ties the Heroes games and the Mind Magic games together, and from this point on, both of the games are completely connected by plot. So that's another reason why it's so exciting. Also, there's no setup guide for this game that I'm making here, because this game doesn't really require much setup. The only thing that I had to do is to install Greyface's patch. I will put a link to it in the description of the video. And generally speaking, it just runs fine with the patch. I'm running this on Wine, on Linux, so it runs on Wine just fine as well. I had some weird crashing issues, like with the base game it worked fine. When I installed the patch it would crash. Then I messed around a bit with the mm6.ini file, and it started working again, and then I reverted all the changes to the file and it still continued working. It's weird, but, I mean, it works now, so, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we're not done with the story itself. Because, 
there is a manual. And still, this is from the time where manuals were quite important. So, let's go through the manual itself. It's quite interesting. Uh, let's switch to that. So, we have Clavis Verge, discouraging the unworthy. Enjoying your world, are you? It must be nice being so secure where you are, what you do, and who you know, most everyone around you is much the same, I'd imagine. Ah, unfortunately the uh, font is not great, so yeah, I have to check where all the full stops are and whatnot. But anyway, and you're all such a herd of sheep, slow and simple, and when the knife comes from behind to catch your throat, all you'll have time to do is squeak, bah! Or maybe you're different. Maybe you've got the fortitude to see beyond the safe illusion. Or maybe you're just a fool rushing in where pagan deities fear to romp. Either way, we need your skills. And your heart. I am the Yuo Mage Clavis Verge. No doubt you've heard of me. Eh? What? Well, no matter. You're ignorant to a lot of truths in the universe. I'm here to educate you. To open your eyes. Accept this... Except this, your world is not your own. At best, it's a window on a reality of might and magic, Enroth. A new world to you, perhaps, but a land of long tradition, now facing a harrowing danger. If it collapses beneath the horrors now threatening to overrun it, your world will most assuredly be destroyed, shattered all the way down to its foundation. Survival of both worlds, your own and Enroth depends on your actions. No pressure, though. You have the tools before you. You call them by strange names, computer and keyboard. They're no different than the crystals and cast runes I've worked with for centuries. Using them, you can work my kind of magic, reaching through that window to draw together a party of adventurers and guide them to victory. There's no reason not to, except fear. Decide now your course of action. Will it be cowardice? They're holding a place for you back in the pen with the rest of the sheep. Or will it be courage? Alright, let's continue. King Roland is missing. Panic! It's gnawing at everything, everyone, everywhere. Some say Doomsday is coming to call, that it's being foretold in the stars. There's no shortage of men and women buying into that, cowering out in the night sky. More troubling still are the ones looking to those demon stars for twisted guidance. A cult has formed, the Temple of Ba, with a taste for fear and uncertainty, and a hunger for the end of the world. Their terrible desire has sent them to sowing seeds of disaster across the land. It's fertile soil for the Doomsday Cult's dread, King Roland is missing, Prince Nikolai is too young to manage the realm, and Queen Catherine is away in Arathia, attending to the funeral of her father. A council of noblemen runs the show, but there's nothing noble in the spiteful infighting between the lords and their lackey councilmen. While they snipe at each other for personal gain, the Temple of Ba grows more deadly. I fear the noblemen are positioning themselves to replace King Roland's reign, with a dark theocracy. Yeah, interesting points raised here. So indeed, King Roland is missing from Enroth. If you recall how everything went in Heroes of Might and Magic 2, the canonical path is that King Roland was involved in the Succession War against his brother Archibald Ironfist. Well, Roland back then was just Roland Ironfist, and he managed to defeat Archibald and turn him into stone, and then he became the next king. All seemed well, but uh, now he's missing. And Queen Catherine, Catherine Ironfist, I suppose, is away to Erathia, the other continent that uh, Heroes of My Magic 3 is taking place on. And currently, where uh, Yogg, Craghack, Jem, and Jelu are quite busy fighting Sandro. Um, 
And yeah, Queen Catherine is there to attend the funeral of her father. That is also true, and we will get to that point at some point later. And indeed, what he says here is true. There is a prince, Prince Nikolai, who is too young to actually do anything, and there's a regent in, uh, in the country of Erathia. No, the country of Enroth, rather. Uh, that takes care of the business in the meanwhile. But it's not all good. And there's the Temple of Ba, that are trying to do something bad. Worse, I am tempted to believe the rumor that one of the council members may himself be High Priest of the Temple of Ba. You'll have plenty of opportunity to determine that for yourself because the council is essential to your journey through Enroth. They hold the keys to the mighty oracle, and they'll only agree to let you in if you meet their self-serving needs. They'll want to set tasks for the adventurers in your party, quests that may distract you from uncovering the evil that gnaws at the land. If you fail, our worlds die. Never forget that. But if you succeed, the adventurers you guide will gain experience and skill. And they may yet be the ones to restore the Mandate of Heaven. Well, that is the core of this game, indeed. To seek the Oracle, but we have to do a bunch of quests to get access to it. The Mandate of Heaven. What is this mandate, exactly? If you have to ask, you may never understand. Some call it the moral order of the universe, the opposite of the cold terror breeding up there in those abhorrent stars. To do what is right, instead of what is to your own advantage. Sounds simple, doesn't it? And yet, why do so many rulers resort to force in place of leadership? If a king embraces the moral order and follows it, then he is worthy to rule. If not, he has no business, no right, to sit on the throne. For he's lost the Mandate of Heaven. The Temple of Ba schemes to destroy for all time that pact between the gods above and the earthly rulers of this land. Their doomsday stock in trade, monstrosities and disaster, conspire to convince the people that King Roland Ironfist has lost the very same mandate they wish to obliterate. The Temple followers whisper that rebellion is the only way to reclaim the favor of the gods. And rebellion will place the friendly neighborhood doomsday cult in power, naturally. The Oracle understands this better than anyone. For centuries, he has been the link that carries the gods' mandate. She? Okay. She has been the link that carries the gods' mandate. Find her, and she may help you stop the destruction of previous order, and repair the damage already done. Fail, and learn to love chaos. So indeed, what is the Mandate of Heaven? Well, the concept is that a king rules the land by the Mandate of Heaven, which means that the king is a representative of the gods. That's the regular uh, description of the term. I guess this game interprets it a bit differently, <laughs> and it tends to overuse the term quite a bit, but alright. So next up are letters. These letters are the last link we have to the king. And all of these letters are from King Roland. July 28, 1152-AS, I believe, after the silence. My beloved Catherine, it is my sincere hope that this letter will lay to rest the fears you have expressed for my safety and that of my men. As you must understand, this trip could not be avoided. Both the Kilburn investigation and the Blackshire apartment require my personal attention, and I haven't visited the Northwest in ages. It troubles me that you should fret over my welfare during my absence, however short it will be. 
So please, dear, accept my promise that I will return by September without mishap. After all, what could go wrong? I have 500 armed men in my expedition, all of them veterans of the Archibald campaign. I'm a popular king, traveling in lands no one disputes as mine, and we have heard no news of rebellion or unrest. Many people flock to watch us pass through their hamlets and villages, eager to get an admiring glimpse of the king and his men. Nothing stands in our way and no dangers beset us. Even the monsters are scarce. We've seen but a handful of goblins and ogres, and not even one dragon. The only trouble we've had was a freak snowstorm that struck as we entered the village of Rockham. Even that, peculiar as it was, was of little consequence as the villagers put us all up for the night in their houses and barns. Of the devils that some say plague towns in the northwest, we have only rumors. We have not yet encountered a soul who claims to have seen one himself, nor anyone who has found the bodies of Lord Kilburn and his rangers. The only devils we have seen are these huge mosquitoes that love the swampland so much. Wretched pests. My place in history would be assured if I could only think of a way to rid the world of such nuisances. No, Catherine. Lord Kilburn was probably slain by something much more mundane than devils. Perhaps a pair of dragons, or a large band of highwaymen. Either way, we shall resolve his disappearance in short order, bringing any human culprits to justice, or slaying any monsters. I cannot have my men attacked with impunity. Now, once again, put your fears to rest, and believe me when I say that I will return come September. Tell our son Nikolai that I love him, and know that I love you with all my heart. Forever yours, Roland Ironfist. So, Roland is on a campaign to find Lord Kilburn, who has gone missing somewhere. There are some rumors about devils, but it seems that they're just rumors. And these letters are also addressed to Catherine Ironfist. The king has a good heart, but he would be well advised to make room for a little suspicion. August 4, 1152 AS. Dear Catherine, Due to the snowstorm in Rockham, of which I wrote you last week, we have reached Blackshire one day behind schedule. By the time you receive this letter, we shall once again be on our way, following the leads we discovered while in town. Kilburn's expedition disappeared a few days march west of here, so we shall soon reach the site of his last stand and begin tracking the killers. Blackshire received us enthusiastically, and a few hours' consideration was all I needed to select a new town magistrate. His name is Acton Spindler, formal replacement for my previous magistrate of old friend Aaron Hampton. I have reason to suspect that Hampton was murdered, poisoned to be specific, but there is no time for me to conduct another investigation personally. Instead, I am leaving Phineas Hogworth be behind to look into the matter. Ordinarily, I would not involve myself in local criminal matters, but Hampton's death fills me with vague unease. It is probably a much simpler matter than that, but I'm nonetheless anxious to learn the results of Hogworth's inquiry. In the meantime, I am proceeding with my investigation into Kilburn's death. Yesterday evening, at the inn in Blackshire, I received a letter from a rather nervous messenger who said he was paid to bring it to me by a mysterious stranger who didn't look quite human. Pressed for a description, he could only say that the stranger was very tall and broad-shouldered. You know, big, like he barely fit into his own body. And that he wore a head that could have concealed inhuman ears. The letter turned out to be a map showing a location near Kilburn's last known camp, with the name Kilburn circled in red ink. I smell a very obvious trap, which could of course conceal a more devious plan, but I cannot see exactly how. Or perhaps the strangers honestly tried to help anonymously. Either way, no trap set by man or monster can overwhelm the fighting force I have with me. Caution will see us through this safely. I will, of course, write you when we arrive in Edenbrook. You're always in my thoughts, and I miss you dearly. Please convey a father's love to Nikolai. Love, Roland Ironfist. Alright. So, 
it looks like uh, things are going okay, except that a town magistrate has been murdered, seemingly. And uh, there are some names that have been mentioned here. I believe we will uh, hear of those names again. Also, with the names of the locations, we will visit, I think, all of them, or nearly all of them. And Lord Kilburn is also a thing. So let's see what happened afterwards. Never underestimate the combination of devils and army in one sentence. August 11. 11.52 AS. Dear Catherine, I cannot honestly say that our trip to Edenbrook was uneventful. As we approached the town, we encountered, we encountered a trickle of refugees fleeing Edenbrook that gradually increased to a flood. When questioned, they told us that an army of devils had been spotted walking and hopping toward Edenbrook, a town with no wall and no standing garrison. I immediately increased our pace to reach the town before the monsters could sack it. It was well that I did, for our arrival was but hours ahead of the enemy. Exhausted and ill-prepared to fight against an unknown enemy, my men nonetheless girded for battle. I ordered archers to the hilltop overlooking the town, and infantry to hide amongst the houses near the road, with flanking cavalry out of sight around the hill. Thirty men on horseback were sent on ahead to lure the enemy into the trap. It worked. The devils must have lacked an even rudimentary discipline or intelligence, for they immediately gave chase to my men. The horsemen raced past the archers hiding below the crest of the hill, and passed into town with the devils hot on their heels. The bait was taken, the trap sprung. As hundreds of the most filthy, vicious and stupid beasts ever to draw breath filled the road beneath the hill, I gave the archers the signal. Arrows rained down upon the devils from above, while the infantry sprang from their hiding places to bar entrance to the town. Before the first shock of the two armies' clash faded, the light cavalry rode around the hill, charging into the main mass of devils with lance and sword. Then the battle began in earnest, and it was all we could do to hold our lines against the demonic horde. Though the battle was short, the tales of valor and bravery are many. Sir Ragnar rescued chief sorcerer Tanir from certain death when he was set upon by no less than five devils after his firewall spell failed. Ragnar charged into the group swinging wildly and screaming like a barbarian. His first swing lopped one head clean off while the next skewered an enemy through its black heart. The other three devils quickly overcame him but uh, recovered Tanir slew all three with his famed Insides Out spell in time to save Sir Ragnar. You'll be happy to hear that he is recovering nicely at the House of Healing in Edenbrook, and will be out of bed in no time. Unfortunately, many were not so lucky. Others who survived the combat itself contracted a disease our healer says was caused by the filthy condition of the Devil's Claws. In all, 83 men fell in the fight against those devils. Yet, we have providence to thank that our fortuitous arrival in Edenbrook's hour of need prevented the death of hundreds more. The devil suffered much heavier losses, 272 dead. The survivors, much less than half, thankfully, fled as one on some sort of unseen signal, and we were too exhausted to give chase. After a short rest here, we will hunt them down and finish them off. I know you'll want to know that I have survived the battle unscathed. I fear that I have just written... What I have just written may be disquieting, but you would never forgive me for telling you anything but the truth. I'm entrusting my advisor, Sulman, to take care of the detail of informing the families of the Fallen, as I have entrusted him with so many other things, including the delivery of these letters to you. He will handle the matter with tact and can be relied on to select the speediest messages for my letters. Eternally, Roland Ironfist. P.S. I will send on another letter after we have caught up to that demonic army and dispatch it. You and Nikolai should hear from me in about a week. Okay, so things happened. Apparently, the devils are no myth. 
and in fact they are doing quite a lot with attacking towns that are poorly defended. And Roland was just in time to defend Edenbrook. Interesting enough, there is talk about Sir Ragnar and Tanir. Ragnar was mentioned in Heroes of Mind Magic 2, and I don't know if Tanir was a person that was mentioned or not before, but in any case, those are quite important people. And also Solman, who is a trustworthy um, sorcerer, I believe, uh, who is in charge of sending these letters to Queen Catherine. And the battle went well. The devils are not so uh, difficult to deal with, thankfully. So, next. Confidence is a good thing. Overconfidence can be an epitaph. August 18, 1152 AS. August 18. So that's in a week. Dear Catherine, before the sun rose over the Battle of Edenbrook, we departed to give chase to the monsters. Clouds streamed over our heads, very like the ones that delayed us in Rockham, threatening more summer snow. Dauntless, my men pressed on, driven by the desire to avenge their fallen comrades and send these foul demons back to the hell from whence they came. The devil seemed tireless and first, stopping only for water and fleeing like darkness before the sunrise. We chased them for days, even though they seemed to be out distancing us mile after mile. Our forced marches and short rests made the hot summer days nightmarish and confusing. Several men were felled by the heat and strain, and we had to send a small contingent of sick men back to Edinburgh, lest they die from the stress of the march. On the fifth day we reached the bitter, barren land of Pleasant Valley. If the demons did not turn from their path soon, we would chase them into the sea. Since we simply could not catch them at the tireless pace, I took a gamble and traveled northwest until we'd reached the old trade road that snaked along the western coast, hoping that when the enemy reached the sea, they would lack any real plan and would follow the road. Again, the enemy proved mindlessly predictable, and again I was able to lay an ambush that proved decisive. With a full day's rest at the narrow pass I had chosen, my men were able to, contri to contrive a vicious ambush that would have turned Archibald green with envy. When fully half of the enemy had f filed into the pass, we attacked, rolling boulders down the cliff face and showering them with arrows. The avalanche we caused blocked the road, splitting the demonic army in half. We concentrated on the part of the army that had yet to travel through the pass, and thus lacked leadership from the front. In minutes we had decimated that portion without a single loss on our side. The remaining army of devils immediately fled north, chased by our arrows and curses. Considering the small number of devils remaining, 45 or so, and the difficulty in chasing them any further, I declared the mission a success, and we spent the night celebrating our victory. The celebration, I fear, was premature. As the night hours were on, my outriders began to return from their scouting details, with the reports of an army of devils, numbering in the thousands, traveling out of the Badlands in our direction. I was forced to order a retreat, hunter and hunted, reversing roles. Catherine, I read this letter to you during one of our infrequent and brief rest stops. Our pursuers are faster than us and do not tire us easily. My scouts and seers report that the, that the demons have followed our trail despite all efforts to shake them, and these horrible summer stone storms seem to pursue us as relentlessly as the devils themselves. I fear there is a traitor amongst us, somehow signaling the enemy our every move. My dear, I want you to give this letter to Wilbur Humphrey. He is to organize an army large enough to put these devils down, say 25,000 men, and do it immediately. I also want you to call upon Rockland, the king of Borgs, and inform him of the situation. He'll come, this danger affects both our kingdoms, and he also owes me a favor since I came to his aid during the succession wars against my evil brother Archibald. 
In the meantime, we will flee east again to seek a fortified location that can hold off the demonic army until help can arrive. I'm not going to reveal the location until we arrive there, for fear these messages will be intercepted by the enemy. I'm having Solomon dispatch our fastest messenger with this message. May you get this soon and act on it sooner. I'm counting on you and thinking of you and Nikolai all the time. Roland Ironfest. Okay. So, looks like Roland managed to catch up on the devils. Managed to defeat a good portion of their army. But then, there are more devils that just appeared. Numbering quite a bit more than the remainder of Roland's army. And now Roland is fleeing and trying to hide from the devils. It's interesting that, once again, Wilbur Humphrey was mentioned. He is the regent, currently, of Enroth. And Rocklin, the king of dwarves, is, well, the king of dwarves. He will also be someone that we will see in the game. Alright, August 23, 11.52 AS. Okay, so that's quite a bit later. My beloved, we reached Castle Creekspire a day ahead of the enemy and have fortified our position in anticipation of attack. This is the last message you will receive from me until we are liberated by the army you and Humphrey are preparing. I thank the gods that I reserve this particular castle as a future reward for some loyal knight or nobleman. And it has been unused since the succession wars having formerly belonged to a supporter of my brother. Provision here is Amiga. We are counting on resupply from either Rockland or you, as we can only hold out for two weeks with the available rations. The forces we have here are barely adequate for defense, and we should be able to last until your reinforcements arrive. Hurry! We have spent some time exploring the castle, finding many secret passages and surprises. Perhaps we may even find an escape tunnel. If the wall is breached, the traps, pits, and secret ways will serve as well. I hope it never comes to that, but it is best to be prepared. I will be much relieved if the treacherous necromancer who used to own this castle was paranoid enough to have dug an escape tunnel. Sulman has been a great help during this entire misadventure, and he has promised to look into the cause of the snowstorms. He is, after all, a master of air, to see if they are divinely sent. Another has already formed over our castle and is even now covering us with snow and misery. Devils seem to operate better in cold weather. Anyway, this siege will give Solomon plenty of time to look into the causes. Perhaps the traitor, that is surely amongst our ranks, is also the cause of the storms. Fear of such a traitor has me sleeping poorly at night. Presuming I could ever sleep well in these circumstances. What would a man have to gain from such treachery? A high post in the devil hierarchy? I would like to see that. Wealth? The devils even have wealth. What could it be? If there is such a traitor, I shall catch him and have him publicly strung up and tortured. The thing that he is probably hiding under my very nose makes me sick unto death. There is nothing worse than a traitor. Even Archibald would agree. Well, no use complaining. He will show himself. He will show himself soon enough. I'm sure. I must go and finish preparations for the siege. Know that if I never see you again, I love you and I love Nikolai. And if you love me half as much, move as fast as you can to send reinforcements to our rescue. Pray for us, Roland Ironfist. P.S. If I should fail to return, tell Nikolai that the third eye is in the well. He'll understand when the time's right. It is his birthright, and he will need it if he is ever to be king. King Roland places much faith in his son. Hmm. Perhaps the prince can be an ally in your own quest. Okay. So, looks like... Uh, looks like it's not going all that well for... Uh, Roland. It's interesting that... Uh, 
there is this castle that belonged to a necromancer during the Succession Wars. Castle Creek's Fire. And that's where uh, Roland is hiding. Or at least was hiding back then. And there's an inevitable siege by the devils. And then there's also this whole matter of very strange weather, snow during the summer. Perhaps there is a way that Roland can escape with an escape tunnel, but it's unclear whether Castle Creekspire has that. Yeah. And there is a traitor amongst Roland's men. And it's unclear who that traitor may be. All interesting things to consider. There are two types of magicians, the quick and the rotting, moldering warm flavor food for spawns of evil. And that's everything from the story side. Letters from King Roland to Queen Catherine Ironfist. Also, uh, interestingly enough, um, yeah, the letters were sent by Roland, but it's obvious that the reinforcements that Roland asked for somehow did not seem to arrive at Roland's location, even though he had this plan to actually have them to happen well in time. So it's not clear whether these messages did reach Queen Catherine. And also, you know, in these cases, I think it would have been quite useful for Roland to make use of one of those uh, magic necklaces that uh, he used during the Succession Wars. The communication through them is much more efficient. But, in any case, that is all of the story in the, uh, in the manual. And now I'm just going to go through the rest of the story and I will finish the video off. I'm not going to create the party, but uh, I will give you a bit more time if you want to decide on who is going to be in the party. So, for now, let's just see the last bit of the story that we have here. Having cheated death during the night of shooting stars, you find yourself as far from your village of Sweetwater as old Falagar's magic could take you. Three years have passed while Falagar imparted what knowledge he could to train you in your chosen professions. But the time came at last when he could teach you no more, and you have ventured into the world to seek your fame and fortune. Now, a world away from your lost home, you have stumbled across evidence of a terrible conspiracy involving a new religious cult. Five letters from King Roland to his wife Catherine, and a letter from the King of the Devils to a wicked traitor named Sulman have turned up in an abandoned goblin camp. Your fate seems inextricably bound to these letters and that awful night, and your role in the events to come may be larger than anyone could imagine. The tools you have are but a small sum of gold, your wits, and a lot of potential. The roads ahead are infinite, and all the choices are yours to make. So choose wisely. Good luck. Yes, indeed. So it turns out that Sulman, that uh, was a very trusted advisor of King Roland, was the traitor all along. And the Night of Shooting Stars is when the devils, that you may also now know as the Cregan, have arrived on the planet of Enroth. And they, in fact, landed around Sweetwater, that uh, was also mentioned in Roland's letters. And we, the party, have escaped from Sweetwater and trained for three years under this uh, friend of ours and uh, managed to 
become quite experienced in our chosen professions. But what the professions are? Well, it depends on the party creation. We need to choose that ourselves. I already know what I want to choose, but I don't yet know exactly what names I will give to the party members. So you still have a bit of time to um, have your say in it. So that will be all for now, and next time, party creation and actual start of the game. See you then, later.